Beyond Resilience is a series of curated conversations created by Firelight uh, with the purpose of exploring the challenges, strategies, and experiences of creating and distributing work during a time of crisis. Nobody's going to give us any power until we ask for it, until we demand it. The role of storytellers right now is to tell those stories that people are refusing to tell and to do so in a transparent manner. It is critical to me that my team, again, reflect the community that we are going to be talking about or the community that is the subject. There are so many missing narratives in the Black experience that would do so much to help both the understanding of Black people in our current situation, but also other people who are trying to understand what's going on. The decision makers need to change. Um, it is not okay that this small group of white folks are the ones who determine which stories matter, which filmmakers matter, and, and des decide and set the terms on which these stories are made. That is literally what has gotten us to the place that we are in. We're talking about systemic change, you know, not a one-time grant to, to, uh, to, you know, a couple of organizations. That, that, that's what we need. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcia Smith. I'm the president and co-founder of Firelight Media. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am an African-American woman with a modest fro um, against a Zoom blurred background. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for what I know will be a very exciting conversation. We'd like to start the conversation with a land acknowledgement to raise awareness of indigenous presence and land rights. We all have a responsibility to consider what it means to acknowledge the history and legacy of colonialism. I am sitting in Harlem, New York on the land of the Muncie Lenape people. And we encourage all of you to make land acknowledgements in the chat, in the Zoom chat, um, our event moderator will drop a link to a resource regarding land acknowledgement for those of you who wish to learn more. Before we start, a few thank yous. Thank you first to the Firelight Media team who put this event together, including Nicole Docta, Felicia Chanko, and Justin Sherwood. Thank you to Open Society Foundations for their support of the Beyond Resilience series. The project is also supported in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York City Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. And thank you also to the Firelighters, a generous group of individual donors who support provides vital funds for Firelight Media and our family of filmmakers. If you're interested in joining them and becoming a Firelighter, please use the link in the chat to make a tax deductible donation. We have just, I think today, launched our spring fundraising campaign, oh, yesterday. Um, so this is a great opportunity for it to join us and to learn more about what we're doing. Uh, lastly, thank you to our ASL interpreter, Andrea Lust, for your brilliant ongoing interpretation services. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, lastly, just a word about Firelight Media, which is in its 21st year as a premier destination for nonfiction cinema by and about communities of color. Firelight produces documentary films, supports emerging filmmakers of color and cultivates audiences for their work. Firelight's programs include the Documentary Lab, an 18 month fellowship that supports emerging filmmakers and Groundwork Regional Lab, which support early stage filmmakers in the American South Midwest and US territories. In addition to a focus on excellence in filmmaking, Firelight develops strategies, partnerships, and materials to reach and engage diverse audiences and maximize the impact of documentary films. And now I'm gonna stop talking, but first I wanna introduce Clayton Davis, who is our moderator today. We are very excited that he was able to join us and very grateful that he's gonna play the role that he's playing today. Clayton Davis is the Film Awards Editor for a Variety. 
He also founded and was the editor-in-chief of awardscircuit.com. He's covered awards, film, and television for more than 15 years. He's also the founder and president of the Latino Entertainment Journalists Association, a member of Critics' Choice, and a member of the African American Film Critics Association. And I should also say, because he may not, he will be covering the Oscars this Sunday, the pregame show for five hours. <laughs> Thank you, Clayton. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Marsha. And uh, hello everyone watching out there. Um, my name is Clayton Davis, again, Film Awards Editor of Variety. Uh, I am wearing a dark blue sweater with a dark blue hat with a gray vest against a white background and the ASL interpreter won't lie and say I have the largest muscles anyone's ever seen. So I just wanna put that out there as well. But joining me on this great panel today, we have Ramona Diaz, director of A Thousand Cuts. Hello, Ramona. Hey, Clayton. We have Carrie Lozano, filmmaker and director of the documentary film program at the Sundance Institute. Hello, Carrie. Hi, Clayton. Hi. Uh, film critic, Carlos Aguilar, also a member of Leha. How you doing, Carlos? Good, thank you for having me. And publicist, David Magbiel. Hello, David. <laughs> Hello, Clayton. Hey, everybody. Ah, so glad everyone's here. It's always good to just kind of be somewhat in a, in a room together, even if it's virtual. Um, this great conversation uh, about representation, documentaries. And uh, this year we had 238 documentaries be submitted uh, for the Academy Awards for the documentary feature category, the largest ever, beating out the previous record of 170 by quite a lot. So I always you know, like to start here. I mean, why is this relevant? Why should, you know, we care about the awards? It's something that I feel like I'm always kind of banging the drum on and try to bring people uh, to the fray and tell them why it's so important. But I'd love to hear your your uh, reasoning. I'll start with you, David, since you've worked so closely uh, with so many of these filmmakers over the years. Well, I think, you know, this year, particularly because it's a pandemic year, and the, the rules really changed. We were so many great films that were in the mix for documentaries. Um, and I think, you know, it was, it was a, as someone else said, it's a lot of competition, but there were some really good ones. Um, and it was tough because everybody would stay at home. But even with stay at home, we found on our end that a lot more people were looking for really good content. A lot more people were looking at documentaries. On um, the documentaries that we worked on, we were getting a lot more engagement, you know, with people coming and watching films and asking for links to see things. I mean, I'm not just talking about, you know, Academy voters, but also people who were viewing films just in general. Um, and I thought, you know, in the grand scheme of things, because this was pandemic, because it was stay at home, we were able to get more people, especially Oscar voters, to watch films, I felt. Um, at home now, whether they watch them all the way through or whether they turn them off, you know, if it wasn't for them, we don't know. But I felt like it was a lot, uh, it, it felt like it leveled the playing field for some of the smaller films that weren't with some of the larger distributors. Um, and then it was just an opportunity for a lot of films to get seen that maybe didn't qualify like they had to before, like being in a theater, both in New York and in LA but then they were had to be part of a certain film festival. So there was opportunity, I thought, this year with that. You know, there were some downsides to some of this because a lot of things got overcrowded. Yeah. But the best thing, and I'm just saying from a campaign standpoint, I didn't have to worry about flying to, you know, flying people in from Kenya. We could like, you know, talk and have these Zoom conversations. And I found there was so much more community this year within the documentary world because the people who wanted to come in and listen to the filmmakers talk about their film were the people that really wanted to be there. They weren't there for the food, they weren't there for the champagne, but they really came to be there. There were some downsides here because we didn't have that collective kind of like feeling that we normally get when we get to gather. But I think overall it was, I think it leveled the playing field for a lot of these films. Uh, I, completely, I completely agree. Uh, Ramona, you, you know, having one of those uh, 238 that were in the mix with a thousand cuts, which by the way, everyone should make time and go see. Uh, if they haven't yet. But Ramona, what are your thoughts on, you know, why something like this matters? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, it matters because it amplifies the films. 
right? It uh, puts the films in front of a lot of eyes. And to me, it's always about, you know, at the end of the day, I don't make films to, to win awards. I make films because of the awards. The, the fact that, you know, it's eligible for awards is nice. I'm not saying validation is not important to me. Validation is important, of course, but the work and getting it out there um, is um, as important too, or even more important. That's why, that's why I think the awards matter. And I mean, it will be disingenuous of me to say that, no, uh, you know, I wouldn't want a, a Academy Award nomination or, you know, but that's not, but that isn't the, the, the goal of me, at least for me, that's not what drives me to make films at the end of the day. Um, and that's why I, th I, I think it's important. It was really, um, it was really uh, different this past year uh, because we had to reinvent the wheel at every step of the way. It was like reading tea leaves, right? Are the theaters going to be open? Are they not going to be open? So, um, and I had such a great team behind me. Uh, David was actually part of the team and they just were so smart about the whole campaign. And I'm very lucky, you know, I realized I, I'm lucky I had a team behind me, but, um, and, you know, along the way we, we, Gardner Awards, right? We, we, we got recognition from the IDA, from Cinema Eye, from uh, got a, won the Gothams and all that, but we didn't get on the short list. But then, then you have to reassess, right? What are your metrics for success, yeah. right? The film is out there, it's getting seen, it's made. So, you know, of course it's heartbreaking. You, you, cry, you scream and shout for a week and then you move on and make the next film. But, but yeah, but it, it is important. It's part of um, also... I guess the ecosystem of uh, of filmmaking. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Carrie. A lot of these filmmakers typically will make stops at Sundance and do make some stops at Sundance, you know. And you, I would imagine, probably see so many more documentaries than any film critic or journalist does in a given a given year. Why? Why does something like this uh, matter? You know, to your industry. Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm going to be totally honest here. You know, I vacillate um, because I think to Ramona's point, it's like it is about the visibility of the films and, and of the filmmakers, too. And at the same time, you know, it can't be the be all end all. Um, out of 238 films, you know, we have five nominees. And um, that doesn't say anything about the excellence of, you know, the rest of those 200 and, and you know, now I have to do math alive, 233 films, right, <laughs> that didn't get a nomination. And so, um, you know, we were talking the other day about really how the campaigning in the documentary space has changed dramatically over in recent years. I attribute that to the shortlist personally, um, because now there's a, there's a kind of perception that if we can just make the shortlist, like I don't have to be one of the five, but if I can just make the shortlist, then it's, it's the campaign is worthwhile. So things have really changed and, um, and, and not all for the better, to be totally honest. So um, I think uh, it's amazing to get an Academy Award nomination or any award recognition, doesn't matter what the award is. It's always validating because this is hard work um, for anyone in the audience who's not a documentary filmmaker. You know, films on average take five years to make. Um, they're incredibly hard to fundraise for. The model is incredibly competitive. So that validation is meaningful. Um, but um, it's really interesting now to be kind of in this Hollywood campaign frame of mind when we really are like a field that, that kind of thrives on scarcity. So um, it's a mixed bag, but I think by and large, it is about the, the visibility. And if you look at the nominees for tomorrow, you know, some folks maybe have not heard of Collective or The Mole Agent. And so the idea that those films can be seen by a wider audience is incredibly exciting to me. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, and I always say it's not, it's, not, it's not a bad thing that people would love an Oscar. We all have done the shampoo in the shower, like acceptance speeches. Like it, it happens. Everybody, I'd say it does not make you a bad person. But to you, Carlos, as you know, you and I, you know, as film journalists that follow this frequently, we always hope that we can split ourselves into like five and watch all 238, <laughs> you know, in a year, it's so hard to do that. Um, what, what, what is your take on this uh, conversation about why the awards part of it matters so much? 
Right. I mean, I agree with what everyone's saying. To me personally, you know, uh, you know, someone that writes about film and as a freelancer, you know, um, I, I have this this conflict with people that you know don't want to care about awards or say that awards shouldn't matter. But to me, more than anything else, is an opportunity, a frame to you know through which I can pitch a story on a film that I like. Right? Like if the film is you know nominated or shortlisted or is in that conversation that's an angle that i can use you know to amplify the message the story the filmmaker that is behind it so just on on that basic level to me that that's meaningful right and you know like uh carrie was talking about the shortlist sometimes that that's also affected the way that i'm able to land a, uh, in coverage right like uh sometimes when i'm interested in writing about a film and we're in that awards season so sort of stage before the shortlist, you know, a lot of editors will, you know, straight out say, you know, let's wait to see if it makes it to the shortlist. If it makes it to the shortlist, then I'll be interested in coverage. If it doesn't, then that fades away. So I think that it is, it has, you know, inherently become part of the ecosystem mm -hmm. of, of everything in, in terms of even coverage and how, you know, someone like me can pitch and, and, you know, amplify the message. And I think that's also at the same time unfair for a lot of films. You know, there's so many films and, you know, uh, even if you have the intention uh, to cover them or, you know, amplify them, uh, there's, you know, the, the, the market out there for interest in coverage like that, it's limited. So I do feel like, uh, you know, having the framework of awards sometimes is beneficial, uh, uh, even if, if flawed uh, to, to, to get the films out there. Thank you. Uh, let's go a little insider baseball here. Uh, Ramona, I'm going to throw this to you. Uh, can, you know, as someone who had a film in, in, in the conversation this year, can you enlighten us a little bit about that behind the scenes, uh, kind of inside of the doc <laughs> branch and, and AMPAs and how we get from 238 to then 15, by the yeah. way, with about 600 doc branch members, which is what people fail to realize. And yeah. having a and the required viewing list and all that. Can you please share a little bit about that? So um, just to put it in context, right? So there is an executive committee at the documentary branch. So around uh, springtime, around now, you know, um, the Academy sends out an, um, an email to all uh, branch, uh, doc branch members saying, if you want to opt in to be governor or part of XCOM, uh, press here. So if you want to be considered, you 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 opt in, and a few a months later, maybe they give you the names of people who uh, opt in, and then you vote, and then you find out later who's in XCOM and uh, and or uh, or if you have new governors, right? If your governors were um, uh, uh, were up for to be changed, I think that it's a set limit of years. And so, was sitting on the XCOM technically like a year, and then you can you can sit on XCOM for six consecutive years, I think, and then they change you out. We meet like four times a year to talk about membership. To always, we're all always talking about uh, how to qualify a film, right? That's always part of the conversation because it is ever changing. The platforms are changing. The distribution models are changing. So that's always part of the conversation. So to put in context the number from last year, right? We were really, uh, like everyone else, um, figuring out what was gonna happen. We were really reading the tea leaves. Our theater is gonna open, our theater is not gonna open. Our film festival is gonna go hy hybrid, virtual. So we had to, uh, again, reimagine the qualifying rules. And the intention behind that was really to be inclusive. It was a, from a very good space because we knew everyone was, you know, shut in, locked down, spent so many years on their films, and suddenly it's a pandemic year. They don't know what's happening either. So that was our the attempt of XOM to be to be inclusive of a lot of filmmakers. But as a result, you know, it did spike, right? The the number of qualifying films. So as a doc branch member, you're given um, a certain percentage of films to watch. You have to watch like 15%. Um, and then you get through that list and, that, and then you go to all the other films that you want to watch, right? That you've heard about, that, that's like flooding your email inbox because name recognition is key, right? That's, why, that's, that's what all those e-blasts are for. If you get it, enough you're like okay i'm gonna check out this film and you know you you also know which you are which films are in the running which films are in the conversation so you circle back to that because you want to know what's going on 
But I have to tell you, Clayton, watching the 15% and others, and I try to watch as many films as I can because I'm always looking for the gem that no one's talking about. That gem, you know, and you're like, you watch it and you're like, why is no one talking about this? But that is the game, right? If you don't have a campaign behind you, if you don't have the resources, it can really fall through the cracks. But it g gives you like the richness of, of the field, of the, the great work that's being done and the, a lot of great work that's fall, that falls through the cracks. So the, um, uh, the branch votes on the shortlist, uh, which is 15, and then the branch votes for um, the noms, down to five, and then the entire academy votes for the winners. Hmm. Like, and then we'll find out on Sunday. So that's how that happens. Oh. So I, and, and looking at that and uh, Carrie, you've been privy to all this kind of uh, sea changes and all and everything that's happened. I mean, what 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 piece of advice do you have for those who are going to put themselves in the running again in the, in the future? You know, knowing there's only five and I, I know people like myself have written about I think it's time to expand the nomination pool and we'll get to that by the end. But, you know, when there's limited campaign budgets because you're not, you know, throwing $20 million at a, at a doc uh, to get nominated for an Oscar when it didn't even cost that much to make the doc. Yeah, it's it's a really tough question. And it's something that I talk with filmmakers a lot about. I mean, I've, I've done Oscar campaigns, but in a totally different world than exists now. Um, and so the stakes are pretty high and the expense to, to do an effective campaign is pretty high. The time, the work, you know, it's not just about money, but it's also a lot of work. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, screenings Ramona you did, but there, uh -huh. or David, you can speak to this afterwards, but you know, it's, it's intense. And so again, there's a real upside, but I just really always urge people to kind of ask them, it's like, what's your goal? Why are you doing this? You know, what, what do you want to get out of it? For some people, they kind of, again, they're shooting for that short list. They think they have a really good shot and that's that would make them happy. And they think that would be great for their film or maybe great for the career. Um, and then of course there are the films that really think they have a strong chance. And then there are other people who maybe they feel pressured or, you know, it's like, this in this year, you know, a lot of people, because you could qualify, you know, it was easier. It's kind of like, okay, this is the year to try it. Um, but I always urge people to kind of ask themselves why, why they're doing that, what they think the odds are. Um, and, you know, and to just decide, it's like, do you want to spend that money this way? Or do you want to start developing your next film? So it's a real you know, you just have to look at the numbers. It's a crapshoot. And, um, and if you don't have a campaign behind you with, with some, you know, some significant reach in, in deep pockets, it's really tough. It's really, really tough. And so I don't discourage people, but I just push a little bit to kind of provoke, yeah. like, are, are you thinking this through, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think now it becomes a great, interesting question for David because David, you're on that back, you know, back end with uh, with the documentary filmmakers trying to get them in front of uh, voters, and you've been so you've been so good at it. And I would say I would want to ask you what kind of tools do you use besides, which I think is completely undervalued here. Being a nice person, being a nice person in this industry can get you a lot, I'll get get you going a long way. So, what other tools besides being good? Do you use you, in, uh, you know, those a lot of times we start looking early like if there's some like if, well let's say in a, in a regular like um, year if a film's going to Sundance the question I usually ask them are you do have aspirations for an awards campaign later because that's when you're going to start really the groundwork of finding champions who are going to champion your film it could be champions who are critics it could be champions who are tastemakers whoever those people are and champions within the doc branch that are going to help push this over who will tell other people who will tell other people because that's what's going to be really uh, clear and that's going to be what's going to happen to, to help get that film to get where it is. So let's say, for example, I'll use Mole Agent because we are working on it. It got nominated, premiered at Sundance. People love that film. It didn't win an award, but it kept playing and people kept falling in love and kept falling in love with it. They had very little, little budget. And but we, what happened was the magic behind that where people were sharing amongst themselves that were in the doc branch that were also pundits within like the documentary world 
And it, it, it took from that. I mean, they, like I said, they didn't have a whole lot of, but, and it was a foreign language film. And it was about people in Chile. So that's always, all these things are stacked up against it in that way. But the film kept going through because of one, it was a good film and people enjoyed it. But also it was the Doc Branch people and those people that kept sharing it. Like, that's really good. That's really good. And that was really the kind of like, they said, well, what's the secret sauce? One, the secret sauce is making a good movie. Number two, having these champions, you're going to champion it. And then on top of that, the director, she's like the nicest person in the world, right? So that does go a long way. You want to win the Miss Congeniality Award when you're on this. You want to show up. You want to support all the other filmmakers who are trying to push something. You really want to be part of the quote unquote community. If you're not part of the community, then you're always that person that's on the outside. But then I'm thinking about, let's say there was a film that no one saw coming because we know certain distributors pick set certain films that they're going to support because they know, oh, look, they have Oscar chances. And you see this and you know which ones that, they're going to push by looking in the short documentary category. And there's a film called The Speed Cubers. And it was in the short documentary category. It had one of these things, COVID really like put a, a kibosh on it because it was supposed to come out at, I think, Tribeca. Then it was going to go online, but they couldn't have a life because of the pandemic. So they put it out. What happened, and the short version is, a lot of people within the documentary branch started telling each other. And they're like, oh, this is so good, this is so good. And then it made it to the shortlist. And then folks were like, how did that make it? It didn't have all the right names behind it. It didn't have the algorithm. But at the end of the day, because when that question came up, it was a good movie. It was worth the time that people spent to watch it. And other people were championing people that you trusted. You know, that it's like, you should watch this because you really, and I think also too with 230, and that was in the short, so they had what? Uh, they had a lot, like, it was a lot of, I forget how what that number was, but if someone told you this would be worth your time, you would probably go and take a look at it rather than like spending like, oh, I have to sift through through all of these. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, overall, it's really one, make a good movie that's worthy. Make one that's really, I find that you guys, and I say this to Ramona and Carrie, because you guys are in the doc branch. When I'm thinking about you, I'm thinking, I would try to look like, what is it that, how do they look at these films? And it's going to be one, what is the emotion that you guys are feeling? Because that's the way I look at things, too. Who are the people behind it? Is this person new? Is this person someone that it's their time? And did all these things come together in order to bring this out? Is it an issue that really, if I give them a vote towards the shortlist, will knock it up, you know, in that way? And then if it makes it to a nomination, is that the issue that, you know, we really want to, like, support? So there's all these different things that kind of go, go in with it, you know, and you know, I think of other films like, you know, like Boy State, right? It was like a front runner, front runner. It made it to the shortlist and then it didn't make it to the nomination. And then there was another trigger that went off. I thought, you know what? The Doc Branch has like expanded, right? It's international now. So what used to be a lock for a lot of U.S. based documentary filmmakers used to have a really big say. It's now expanded and the global people came in and said, maybe that's not for me. So maybe not, I don't know, but maybe that's not the, the film that I'm going to vote for. That's the only thing I could think of was like, because that movie was so strong and the filmmaker is like amazing. But, you know, there, if you take a look at that doc branch, the 630 members, they, you guys expanded that, you know, and have a lot more international influence. So it becomes even more global. Yeah. So the yeah, I would, also, yeah but, I, would also, I would also add to that. I think uh, a good point to make is the doc branch, especially, I think more than any branch that's in the academy, it's very reflective of the time that we are in yes. globally and as a country. Yeah. And for something like Boy State, all in the fight for democracy that made it to the shortlist, by, by March, we were all political doubt. We just went through a very yeah. treacherous a uh, political campaign, January 6th happened. You know, we all revere Stacey Abrams. Thank you, like, for everything, you know. But at that point, we were just like, we need to, like, just stop, which is also what hurt films like 76 Days that was about the, you know, the virus, about the coronavirus. And people were like, I've lived through this for the year. I don't want to kind of go through this again. And a lot of times, it's, it's fair or unfair, it is something that happened. Ramona, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that it was a very particular year to what you said, right? I mean, in terms of like a thousand cuts, what we, I mean, to be honest, what we thought was our strength, which was very, it was a very relevant film. It was about authoritarianism, press freedom, weaponization of social media, all those things where 
it was a year that people wanted to feel good, maybe, you know, and, and didn't want to, like, after June 6, after especially the inauguration, it's like, you know, it, it was like a switch in mood. I'm only guessing this because, um, but but I feel it was it, it's a very specific year this year. Um, it, it, and what's going to happen next year, who knows, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the lockdown, being locked down, be, the pandemic, just people wanted to see, like, you know, octopus teacher you know mm-hmm. so so that's why i mean yeah. uh carlos, actually, you know. I have a, we're taking questions from the audience and carlos i have a question i think it's for you and i actually uh for members <laughs> of the entertainment media what steps can we take to give smaller films more of a platform it would be great if there could be more some more democracy in the trade coverage um and i think this actually was going to bring me to my next question you can you wrote a piece for IndieWire back in March about you know the lack of representation especially when it comes to Latinx films what is something that you and I you know can do within within the trades but I think also depending on positioning you, you can go first right I mean I think it's all depending on, on the kind of power that one has right like for example me being a freelancer it's really uh, the strength of that is that if I love a film, you know, if, if I connect with something, I will be a champion for it in the way that I will try to get stories on it somewhere, right? Uh, as opposed to, you know, someone that has had a trade or, or does some staff that, you know, might be, you know, tied to write a certain amount of articles or has to cover this particular film or whatnot. So the strength of, of finding that freelancer that, you know, that really... Uh, connect to your film is that that you find yourself a, a champion to to get that coverage i do think it's interesting to you know to talk about you know for example with that do that latinx uh piece uh it's always interesting to see who what films get the support what this even within a distributor you know like something like mucho mucho more uh you know the the documentary on walter mercado didn't really get much much of a push uh by the distributor and sort of faded away and you know who who gets to sort of decide what what documentaries you know get pushed, and then within that, the narrative that's built in the press, you know, because the the critics and the pundits have a, a role in in sort of what films get you know put into the the conversation, and that's always shaped by like who's the editor, who are they assigning. So it's it's part of all these ecosystem of of what films get the attention, right? Like, because someone like me, I can write a piece on mucho mucho more or whatever film, the more agent. But I can only I depend on like the editor that says yes on how big the outlet that I get to write it for is who's who's paying attention to this outlet or not. So uh, I think it's it, it's a good conversation to have and it's difficult to say what's the best pat, the best pathway to to make it more democratic and and get all the films covered because you know there's a million pieces on one film, but then you know you have 238 films. It's impossible to for all of them to to get the attention, you know, there's the IDA screenings, there's, you know, certain key things that, that certain films do. Um, so I'm always happy to see something like The Mole Agent, which had a small distributor, which is a film from a director that had done other films, but wasn't known as known in the US. And somehow, you know, the strength of the film uh, itself put it through. So yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting conversation depending on your position. I'm sure that you as, you know, someone that's now at Variety have a, a as an editor has a different take on it. Yeah, so I, I think for, for me personally, I think uh, what I always like to stress with, with kind of everyone is that it, it is hard to watch everything. And I think that that's something that people like David have understood for forever, you know, when, when, when we're getting pitched on what, what can be watched. One thing that I have, um, you know, I've only been at Variety less than a year now and thing that Variety has opened themselves up to is amplifying all voices in the industry and i have been a big champion of being able to i I want regular joe schmo you know movie lover to be able to rattle off you know ramona diaz or bradford young off their lips as fast as they say denzel washington (laughs) or tom hanks like i i believe in all kind of facets of that industry and i believe we we have to do a better job of knowing that films aren't just what we can physically see on the screen it's about the people that put in the blood sweat and tears behind the scenes like documentaries in particular i'm still waiting for and i'm I, i've been saying this like all year and david you can uh quote me on this 
I've said, I'm glad I met Variety because I'm going to be here the year that the Academy finally recognizes a documentary for best picture. Like I'm going to be here for this. Like I've made it my business to make sure that happens because we have put these qualifiers on, on, on movies. And I, I hate, I hate the qualifiers on movies and movies and movie, you know, and while we are in this very difficult time, I think where the lines are blurred between film and television, I think that is a conversation we all need to have eventually. Um, I think it's up to people like Carlos and I to, if we can't just do it on our outlets, that's what social media is for. I, I'm always like, you know, I, everyone kind of knows where I stand on my love for movies pretty much all year. And I make sure that that happens and you have to kind of, it's a lot of work, but you also have to make sure you try to see as much as possible. I saw maybe 200, 200 movies this year, more or less. And that may seem like a lot, but I have people that saw 300. And I also feel like there, people really need to come into the fact of, are they really watching the movies? Like, are you, is it just on your TV and you're, or you're flipping through your phone? Like really taking the time to watch movies is a hard gig, especially when you're a parent. But that's just shout out to parents out there, that kids at home <laughs> that were ruining everything for you while you were trying to work. But if I can just add to what you're saying with you guys are in the trade and the media and you're talking about who's championing what behind the scenes. I mean, it's it's sad, but it's also true that it's incumbent among you guys who are in the media to really, you know, kind of like you guys, you guys fight the good fight. But I also think of someone like Jazz Tanke over at um, Variety because she does below the line and she does have a thing for documentaries. I don't know what that fight is, but here's a woman that's in there like, okay, I need to like talk to somebody from, you know, that's below the DP from Mr. Soul, you know, or something like that. And it wasn't like in the front runner, but she was so moved, but she had to like talk to, to that person. But you take a look at the articles that she writes and it's like, it's definitely a lot of it is below the line behind the scenes. So, so I, and, and for us as publicity folks, we're like, okay, who's the one that's going to champion, that's going to make our film, that's going to be separate from everybody else that's saying, oh, front runner, front runner, front runner, right? And then you had Dino uh, Ray Ramos over at Deadline, who was always speaking about inclusion and diversity. And you knew that at least if you went to him, he would at least have that ear. And for us as publicists and, you know, pu publicists who are publicists of color who work on these films that are diverse, quote unquote, I hate that word, but that are about all that, you know, it's just finding those champions who understand, you know, you had, Matt Carey, who's now over at Deadline, who's actually understands it for a white guy. He's like on top, but he also understands it from a documentary standpoint. Yeah. But these documentaries are all important. And so you like, you think about things like that in Steve Pond or where, I don't want to roll call everybody, but you know, there's Steve, these are these folks that I know in the back of my head. If I knock on their door, I don't have to explain that extra layer of what diversity is because they'll get it al already by looking at what that film is. There are others that just don't, and that's okay. Because I don't mind being the educator because that's what I need to be if that's my role. You know what I'm saying? Because I think we're living in a time where inclusion, diversity, Firelight Media, ADOC Networks, Brown Girls Doc Mafia, anybody in this space that's dealing with uh, people of color or as we say BIPOCs now, you know, LGBTQ, anyone who felt on the margins actually have an opportunity to tell their story because we're all looking for those stories. And so if that's what my role is to try to knock on that door, okay, I'll be the educator, but it's that extra layer, but you know, it is what that is. But I think we have opportunity, you know, for all of us that are here in Firelight, this is our moment. This is our time, make your movie, you know? And we can, we can talk about what the award thing is like, oh, I don't have this big distributor's money. But if you have that film and if you knock on the doors, let's say Ramona and Carrie, you know, I know you guys talk to other people and you like, and if it moves you, you will tell somebody if it moves you, because this oh. is you know, these are people. Word, word, of, word of mouth goes far, and yeah. I think also the just the other side of that diversity in journalism. If that yeah. part is there, then it gives a greater like. Jazz, I work closely with Jazz. Jazz and I are always on like all these, things. and we even feel that we're educating upward or outward yeah. about you know when I started here, I had to start at a very basic level. And I think Carlos and I talked about this a bit. When I, my, one of my first articles here was about explaining the difference between a Latino and a Hispanic person, like, and what, like, and why I celebrate Penelope Cruz, but that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about diversity and representation. <laughs> so there's been a lot of, like, 
we educate in the world and we're okay to take on that role if people are willing to listen. Um, Carrie, I'm actually going to throw the next question to you because I brought it up earlier and your face lit up and I'm ready to talk about it. There's five nominees for a documentary feature. I feel like there's just another five that could be added to that because Best Picture, it got expanded to 10 back in 2009. By the way, following the snub of The Dark Knight, they saw they wanted to be included. And one of the things that was said at the time, it was in the press release, we can recognize foreign films and we can recognize a documentary, which has not happened yet. So in documentary with two... Is it time to expand that? What should be done to get that uh, amplified? It's a really great, great question. And I, I can't say that I've, you know, thought about it in a whole lot, except for the, just the volume that you see. I mean, that's what I see in my neck of the woods. It's just an incredible volume of incredible films around the world. It is unbelievable. At Sundance this year in our fund, we've received more than 2000 applications this year from around the world. I mean, it is astounding. Um, and so there's a great argument for it. How it happens is totally beyond me. I mean, that's where Ramona on, her, on the executive committee <laughs> comes into play. I said to her the other day, I was like, I don't understand. How does this stuff work? What's going to what's gonna happen? And I you know I really like the, how those decisions get made, who gets to make them, you know, how does the, the documentary branch weigh in on that? It's, it's like, to me, those are things that I need to understand better and uncover. But I mean, I think there's a really, really great argument for it. And we were talking the other day about, um, you know, that we don't have craft awards at, at the, in the Academy. We don't have best editing and score and, you know, cinematography for documentaries. So I think one way to really acknowledge the breadth of the field would be to expand that pool. At the same time, then I get nervous thinking about all those filmmakers having to do their campaigns, um, you know, and, and go down that road. But I'm curious, Ramona, in terms of, you know, the, are those conversations happening at the executive branch? And is it really up to you guys to make that decision? Well, I, I think it will start with the executive committee. Again, let me say that I am not speaking on behalf of the Academy, okay? This is my experience in the X, in XCOM. I would imagine that if we hear enough from the doc branch, Right. And how how do you contact the doc branch? Go, go to the website, like um, email one of the governors. It's Roger Ross Williams, Kate Man, and Rory Kennedy. Email one of them. If you know, we hear from a lot of the members that this is a thing that needs to be discussed. That will be discussed. Right. So we have. So and I agree. I think it should be more than five. Right. Because we're all clamoring for those five slots at the end of the at the end of the uh, season, which is crazy. And the craft awards, you know, most of those other branches are made up of uh, fiction editors, right? Fiction DP, they vote for fiction people. So should we have our own craft awards? Then I, I, I don't know about, you know, I have to think more about that because then it makes, um, it makes documentary a separate thing again and not part of the entire academy, part of movie making. Right. I mean, even it's talked about when it's talked about uh, very differently, even. So if we have separate craft awards, I'm not sure that's good for the form. Right. But then we should. Uh, I think it should be part of the other craft awards, mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, fiction vote for fiction. Right. And a, a lot of um, editors are in the doc branch. A lot of DPs who shoot documentaries are in the doc branch. We are in the branch and we don't really spread out because once you're invited to two branches, you choose. Right. If you're an editor and you are also invited to the editor's um, editing branch and the doc branch, you have to choose which branch. And a lot of editors I know they, who are also doc branch, uh, doc editors, choose a doc branch. But, but then, Ramona, how, how could we compete against Mank? You know what I mean? Like, if we were to do that, let's just say it's like, how do you then compete against the bit the like truly big Hollywood films would be my question. Well, Nomadland is competing against all those because it's such a well-crafted film, right? So I, I, I guess craft will just have to, right? Every, I mean, we have to start talking about craft. 
And I and once we start talking about craft, then critics will start talking about craft in terms of documentary, which I think is my pet peeve, right? <laughs> when now uh, for um when, when uh critics review documentaries, I'm like, I wish they would talk about craft more because it is there. We it is a film. We've thought about craft and not only story, right? So yeah, it's all of peace. That's why I I don't know. It's something that we really need to to think about and um, figure out how it's going to look. But with the five nominees of best docs, yeah, you can just, uh, it's not that simple because it, it's like a decision that's made up there, but um, 10, 10 noms for docs, right? That'll and be a to, good place to start. To, to, add to, to add to that, Carrie, I think maybe to, uh, as, as you're seeing the, because I think currently right now, in theory, in essence, the only awards that documentaries are not eligible for are the acting categories, right? In theory, I'm not saying that that's, we obviously see what happens. But this year, what we start to see, we start to see little inklings of breaking through, like Welcome to Chechnya made the shortlist for visual effects. Like that was gonna be a huge breakthrough if, if it ended up not getting nominated, unfortunately. But those are, those, when you start seeing like little peaks of like that, I remember like, you know, Hoop Dreams when it didn't get nominated for doc uh, feature, but then got nominated for, for editing, you know? And I remember Bowling for Columbine won the Writers Guild Award for original screenplay that year. So I, I think we, we see these like moments of the acceptance of documentaries as part of the film conversation. And it, it, it's hard to gauge what, what the ingredients are. And I, I know critics play a role in it too, but I think there just has to be a consensus. Cause I, I, I hear like the biggest, you know, cinephiles say to me, like documentaries aren't features. Like that's not what I'm talking about. Like that's its own separate thing because it's real life. And they are like big champions for film. It's something that, that doesn't seem to be a consensus. And I, and I think in agreement with Ramona, I think once you give it its own, you know, categories separate. I think of the Critics' Choice Awards that I'm a member of, we have the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards and they're not a part, the documentaries are not part of our main show anymore. It's its own separate thing. And now I feel like the public misses our voice on those, those films. So it, it, that, I guess there has to be that balance. Carrie, but, please. No, and the Emmy National, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the Emmys does that too, right? You have the news and documentary Emmys, it's a totally separate and very different ceremony, by the way. I mean, it's a really good point. And, you know, and I want to give a shout out to Collective, which is up for best international film this year. So that film did have a breakthrough. And I think, um, you know, I think we've kind of done that to ourselves over yeah. time, right? By just literally over the last hundred years of film history, um, we've done that to ourselves. And I think maybe this is a moment where we can, we are starting to break through and we can kind of keep pushing that and pushing that um, because you're right. There's no reason really. Um, yeah. But, but, and maybe, you know, and I have a lot of ambivalence about the state of our field right now. It's very tenuous for filmmakers. There's like, I keep say, just saying there are the haves and the have nots, but you know, maybe um, with, with the platforms that one thing that could happen is that kind of a breakthrough at some point, but they would have to be behind it, frankly, they'd have to really push that forward. Sorry. That, that, no, that, I was gonna say the international category, it's not only this year, last year it was Honeyland. Yeah. There were a lot of um, docs on the short list, I think for international, right? Um, the there was agent. The Brazilian yeah. film, Mole yeah. Agent for yeah. one. There was uh, the Brazilian film was on the short list, uh, the doc, right? But more and more, it's it's showing up in international. And that is a tough category because you're dealing with like the best filmmakers in the world, right? The fact that Collective is nominated, yay, right? Because it, it, it it's it's a tough one. Yeah. It's a, That's a deep, deep bench, <laughs> the international category. Uh, so just, it's just happening real, there. Yeah. So I don't quick, guys, yeah. so, sorry to cut you off. We, we have to uh, take some questions from the audience. If you're listening, watching, you can submit them uh, via YouTube uh, chat or on Twitter and they're feeding them to me. So you can feel free to ask, ask some, some questions. I don't want to cut you off. I just want to let everyone know you can send questions. I'm going to start getting them uh, shortly. And, and to bring you back, Ramona, to let you finish your point. I'm just always afraid. I'm always feel like I'm one moment, scary, terrible moment away from the Academy kicking the doc feature category to the governor's <laughs> awards and not being able to see it anymore. Like I always have that fear. 
like inside. We're the like, documentary like, branch. They're gonna hear like, from I, us. I always like I, I remember having a conversation with the academy this year, and I was like, "You guys need to do a better job of telling us what the shorts are being submitted are because." The, I can't. I can't get the general public excited about it if I don't know about them. Till you're down to the short list, you know, because we don't know what's what's even in the running. There's something that we all kind of need to do to kind of amplify those uh, those voices. Uh, David, you were gonna, you were gonna add something as well. Uh, I was just gonna. I remember back in 2000, they were trying to delete the documentary short category, and then they people fought for that, and it came and they kept it in there. And if now you fast forward to where we are in uh, 2021 and shorts are so important and they, they live and it's, you know, you don't have to have a 90 minute film or a 150 minute film to tell the story. But I remember that was in jeopardy back in 2000 and here we are, you know, 21 years later. So I think there's always room for change. The change has to come with, it has to come into with your own, um, with your own um, branch is where it has to come into. Yeah. That's what, that's where it has to be. So I think that's where, you know, if we're going to make these changes, it has to, and we're talking about the Oscars itself, it has to come from, from within the Academy and Ramona, you know, you're on the executive committee. So maybe those are the conversations that, you know, have to be, be started. And I know a lot of the people that are in there have had these, these ideas already. So it's, it's, it's not that it's unusual. Do, uh, can I ask Carrie and Ramona, ask you guys a question while we're waiting for a question to come in as two members of, you know, the Academy and kind of seeing this happen. I've observed this kind of like internal civil war. I think you've seen it in the nominations as the Academy has diversified its membership over the past few years. Do you feel that, would, is your take, do you think there is kind of that civil war of an old school thought of mind of what filmmaking is versus what filmmaking is now and the way, the way consumers are able to consume uh, movie making? That's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, Ramona, you might have different insight. I mean, I think there are generational things that are happening in our field everywhere. It's not just the academy. It's not just with voting. That's everywhere, right? And so you have folks who are entrenched and who came up um, in this field in a certain way and have certain thoughts about it. Um, and then you have a, di a diversifying branch in the documentary branch, which I think is, is changing things. Um, and so you know, I wouldn't call it a civil war, but I think in this moment where any institution that's, um, someone used the word blue chip the other day, um, you know, any blue chip institution is going through um, those generational changes and, and, you know, those are gonna butt heads. There's just like, there's no way around that. And, and I think you kind of see that in the um, nominees that are up for, you know, this weekend, right? It's like, you see those different perspectives playing out. And I, I actually think that's a good thing. Like, I don't think that's a negative thing. I think that's a positive thing. Um, so I don't know if you have kind of deeper insight into those discussions, Ramona, but, um, but I don't see it as like antagonistic. It's just like, th that's where we're at. This is a, a field that's rap rapidly changing. And depending on when you entered it and who you are, right. Um, and, and what your experience has been in this business uh, is, is going to have an impact on your perspective. And, and then there are those of us who are kind of here to push back and to push the envelope a little bit. No, I agree. I agree with you, Carrie. I mean, it's evolving pains, right? It's an evolving form, like all forms of art, you have to evolve or not you will stagnate and the form is evolving and there is, yeah, there, there, there is uh, the old school that that is used to one thing, and then there's all the, the other new members. Listen, when I started at XCOM, oh my gosh, maybe it's been five years or four years ago, it was just me and Jin Chen. <laughs> like, I remember, and of course, Roger, right? But through the years, it's become really more, um, again, the word diverse, but it has. And I think that's a good thing. And that reflects on the, on the, on, on the short list, what's getting in the short list and the nominations. It's, I think it's all good, but they will, we will, yes, we will go through those pains, right? Those pains of evolving into something else because the form is evolving. A lot more people are, and I think that's good because it fires up the imagination that's not to say there's no space for the other forms. It's a, right. It's, it's just a matter of pushing the envelope and trying new things. And that's always, always a good thing. 
to try uh, to try other forms and to reimagine um, the documentary. I think that's always positive. I wanted to, I don't know if it's posing a question, but just think about the, which is something to think about in a lot of categories that once, you know, like the dog, the dog branch and the animation branch, you know, they're dedicated folks that really value uh, those mediums and they make very, you know, conscious selections for the nominations and the shortlist in the case of, of documentary. But once the nominees go to the, to the general, you know, the membership, I feel like that to me is always when things go, you know, not sour all the time, but when, when I feel like there's a little bit of this interest in the general membership in categories like international documentary and animation, I think that that's, that tends to be a problem in terms of who gets recognized and who gets championed at that, you know, when you have thousands of members and how do you get them involved and interested in watching all the nominees and sort of like really paying attention to, to categories that are considered, you know, often niche. And I don't know if there's any insight or, or from you, David, or from Clayton, anyone. You know, it's really kind of hard, you know, Ramona was talking about, you know, the emails that they were getting, you know, from like Oscars, FYC. I mean, that's for us, that's the only avenue that we can use for the Academy to target specifically to the uh, Academy voters. And we're only allowed to do that once a week through a mailing house that the Academy has set up. So, you know, we know that's really important because name recognition is so important for everybody across the board. It's not cheap to do. But it's something that you have to do in terms of like staying on, you know, the radar screens for a lot of the people who don't know, who may not vote in shorts, animation, international and documentaries. But, you know, it's just like staying on top of those. So those are always feels like the films that are kind of left behind or very specialized or those who will watch those. So so our tool at the moment, really, in terms of like getting it out to the Academy specifically, has been through the mailing house. And then we do the other stuff, you know, like. We'll do talkbacks with you, Carlos, with you, Clayton, or we'll do set up these special screenings or we'll come with a third party, you know, group like through like a Soho house or something or Museum of Tolerance has been a great partner for us with documentaries because they have they're like the best place. Now I'm going to give my secrets away, but they're the best place. So they've got a place where you can discuss documentaries. They embrace that. The head, the uh, ED over there, Lee Begaff, is just like so embracing, you know, of all that. And so you can have really strong and great conversations there. So we look for those things that where can we be where we think that documentary or academy voters will be? You know, maybe we'll use the Malibu Film Society because then we'll reach those people that are up in the hills that won't come down from the hill, but we have to go where they are. So it's just really looking at what those strategies are. And then we're looking at budgets. It's like, okay, what can we afford? What can that filmmaker afford? Oh, and I always cool. tell people, do not mortgage your house for an Academy Award. Oh, campaign. God, no. Don't mortgage. No, no, no. Yes. No. Say it again, Dave. I had one person do that one year. And luckily, from his campaign, he was make, he was able to make a sale. It never went anywhere, but he made a sale and paid everything back. It was great. Oh. Well, it- Dave, actually, I have a question for you uh, about funding. Uh, can you speak to the campaign costs? And is there a need to rein that in? recently heard someone suggest awards campaign finance reform. I don't, you know what? I, I don't know about that rewards campaign finance reform. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, it just, it is what that is. If, if, if I'm a larger distributor, I'm going to put my money behind, you know, that film that I think might have the best chance for me to win the hardware. Cause hardware for these distributors is really important, whether it's documentary, whether it's fiction film, and we know that's that's just the game that's played. You know, it is, you know, it, unfortunately it is what that is. And I don't I don't really have an answer, to be honest with you on that. You know, is should we have, you know, uh, campaign, you know, reform? I don't know. I, I, I don't think I'd really want to see that. I mean, but I say that today, I might change my mind tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I feel like but I'm I, mean I said that. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm not alone. <laughs> Go ahead, Ramona. No, I think it's up to the documentary community, right? It's a reckoning. It costs a lot of money. And you have to, like, one email blast is not going to do it. So if you think one email blast is expensive, don't do it. Don't do it. Because it is, not only is it um, time-consuming, it's emotionally exhausting. So you won't even be broke. You'll be so tired emotionally at the end. I would never do a DIY campaign. I would, because I would rather, unless, you know, you have indisposable income, but I would rather put that money on my next film, right? At least I know at the end, there is a product. There is my next film. 
because really, what's coming? It, it's it's a horse race, and it, 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 it's a crapshoot. You don't know. I mean, people are very smart, had a great team, but at the end of the day, it may it may not work. I mean, it's like what makes a good film? We don't know, right? What's what makes um film hit the zeitgeist we have no idea if we did we'd all be making all those films but we don't know um sure. you can only do things to make it happen but at the end of the day and money money makes it happen and and uh some distributors are really big and there is no competing against that so know what your know what you want right this is really what you want to do and as a community is it really what we are because Okay, the fiction space has done this for years. They campaign that way. But because we're documentary, right? We make films about real people who are, you know, marginalized or embattled journalists and all this. And suddenly we're spending so much money on a campaign. How do we reconcile that? Of course, it amplifies the stories. But then where do we draw the line, right? Where do we draw the line? That's a conversation we should have. What we do about it? I don't know that there's any that rule that can be done. I don't know. That but is a question though. But I think Ramona being transparent about the cost is important because yeah. I think people start, you know, filmmakers start to go down this road, not really realizing what the cost is going to be. And then they're kind of at every step of the way, having to figure out fundraising at the last minute to get to that next step, that next email blast, that next event, whatever it is. And I think the more transparent we can be about it, the more people will step back and say, okay, do I really want to go down this road? Does this make sense? What kind of support do I have? And to David's point, you know, it is a decision that you make very, very, very early on. Like if you want to get to that finish line, you really should be making it the second your film premieres. Like, is this part of what we're doing here or not? And I think there's no shame in saying, no, this is not what we're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no downside to that, you know, unless you have the deep pockets. I mean, yeah, go for it. Someone's going to pay for it. Go for it. But but it's also the kind of film you're making. I think you have to be realistic. There's yeah. certain films yeah. that don't get the attention, like uh, uh, biopics of antiheroes. They don't. Right. So you have to be realistic. If you're making that film, it's a great film. It premieres out of Sundance, but it won't. It, you know, it will make it. Then just be you know, realistic. We, what is what kind of film are you making? Music docs? Not so much. There are exceptions always, always exceptions, but probably not. So you won't push that way because, again, it is, I mean, use all that energy to make your next film because it is a lot of energy. And once you fall, there's like nothing to catch you. I was, was going to say, you know, there's so. I'm going to give you the. Go I'm going to give David the final word. I was just going to say, it's expensive to even qualify your film. It's not cheap because you got to be in two theaters and get those reviews, and that's a lot of money. Just to, even if you're in a small, small, small theater, it's not cheap. But then I know that you guys who make films have these people who like. I want to fund your Oscar campaign. How much do you need? And then a lot of, I hear these certain, they're like, okay, I've got, you know, X amount from so-and-so. And then that's what it goes for solely. So it's, it's very, like you said, Carrie, it's something you have to decide early on and whether this is really going to be worth the work and the money. Uh, Car Carlos, go ahead. You can give, actually, I'll let you have the Yeah, point. I was just going to say quickly that sometimes there's sort of like the anomalies in this, right? Like something like My Octopus Teacher, which didn't have the buzz for uh, most of the year. It didn't really premiere at a big festival. It wasn't like a critic darling for, for a long time. And then it found an audience, you know, with, you know, regular audiences, you know, to discover the film. And that sort of, I felt, fed into the side guys and eventually, you know, uh, now it's nominated without sort of, like, I don't even think the distributor realized the potential and, until very late. And like, you know, a, a case like this, uh, this morning, this evening, a, a documentary that's very experimental that I felt I never thought it could get a nomination and somehow, you know, it made it. And I feel like those anomalies when something small or sort of like out there gets in, you know, without spending so much money are sort of like the cases that the best case scenario, right? Like that documentary this morning, this evening, probably didn't have a huge campaign. He had a small art house distributor and made it. So I think there's, you know, those cases offer a little bit of hope in, in the, you know, in the process. But they're the exception, right? Right. Yeah. yeah it's definitely not the rule. Yeah. Uh, that's, I would talk to you guys all day, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we have to wrap. But David, Ramona, Carrie, Carlos, thank you so much for having this conversation. Thank you for everyone for watching wherever you are. Hopefully, hopefully you're watching safely and all that. Uh, again, my name is Clayton Davis. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you to Firelight 
and all the firelighters out there for uh, getting this conversation together. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Clayton.